Roxanne Dunbar-Tees to thank. Thank you. Well, it, it's like a dream come true to be here when I heard that um, Labor Fest was forming in Hawaii last year. Those of us who work on it in San Francisco were so excited. Um, four year, three years ago, we started one in Oklahoma City. I'm from Oklahoma, so I helped start it. And um, it's it's like this a day and a night before. It's wonderful. And it has actually you. And in Oklahoma, there's far more actual trade union worker involvement, I have you know, I have to say, in San Francisco. So congratulations for um, for doing this. And I hope it thrives and grows and gets a lot of support. So it's really an honor for me to, um, to be here with you. It's kind of accidental because I was invited to do some um, a symposium on my book, The Great Sioux Nation, at University of Hawaii uh, this week, and just happened to coincide. So I sort of piggyback on the, on being here. I'm really grateful. Um, I wanted first to just before I I get to the Great Sioux Nation and why I think it's uh, relevant to workers and labor um, in. Um, uh, even here in, in Hawaii. I, I want to tell a little bit about my own background. I was um, born, I was raised in Oklahoma uh, by uh, parents who were sharecroppers, sometimes migrant workers, cotton, cotton pickers, but uh, when I was really little, but uh, sharecroppers. So we were very, very poor. My mother's um, part Cherokee, I grew up very, also very poor and oppressed. And my father was a settler, Scotch-Irish settler, of the, the people who kept losing land if they got it, and would be trekking across the country and ending up in Oklahoma. I say all the losers ended up in Oklahoma. And I say that with pride, but it kind of insults other people when you say that. Because I think losing under capitalism is no great shame, as <laughs> almost everyone does. Huh. Uh, but my grandfather, and I heard these stories throughout my childhood, my grandfather, my father's father, Emmett uh, Dunbar, uh, named my father, who was born in 1907, Moyer Haywood Scarberry Pettibone Dunbar. Do those names ring a bell? Those were the founders of the IWW the industrial workers of the world. And they were founded in 1905. My father was born in 1907, uh, the year of statehood in Oklahoma, but also the year that those leaders um, were on trial in Boise, Idaho, for murder, and Charles, um, um, well, so you just set my mind, uh, the lawyer. What? Yes. Anyway, <laughs> um, my grandfather had joined the Socialist Party and uh, in uh, Missouri before they moved to Oklahoma. He was already active. He had seven children already. He's a veterinarian. And um, when he moved to Oklahoma, uh, he joined the IWW. It was active in Oklahoma with the, uh, you know, IWW was mainly active with migrant workers, miners, migrant miners, but also wheat thrashers and the oil workers in Oklahoma, the coal and the coal miners. So Oklahoma was a very, uh, unlike Steinbeck's, uh, you call it description, it was a very industrialized place. It was a very radical place. The uh, trade union movement there, the Socialist Party, IWW sort of, um, turned everything to the left so that the first state flag was a red flag <laughs> with a 46 on it. I'm not kidding. In 1922, after the labor movement was crushed in Oklahoma, uh, they banned the flag 
and it is illegal in Oklahoma to this day to fly a red flag. And we keep flying them, hoping to get arrested. But, <laughs> but uh, so far, no arrests. Uh, the state seal was a hammer and sickle. <laughs> mosaic in the state capitol. And the right-wing Republicans who run the state now only recently figured out that that Latin, that Latin word meant labor conquers all. So they wanted to have it jack, uh, you know, to um, dig it out. And, and they haven't yet. But. So one thing we're trying to do there, and I think it's really um, that's what Labor Fest is doing there, and I highly recommend it. Is is finding that radical history? It exists everywhere, and making that a part, you know, the story. Getting plaques put up. We do labor tours in San Francisco. We also did that in Oklahoma City and Central Oklahoma. So I just wanted to start off by reading what hung on the wall of our sharecropper cabin as I was growing up in Oklahoma. And you will probably recognize this, these words. The working class and the employing class have nothing in common. There can be no peace so long as there is hunger and want are found among millions of working people. And the few who make up the employing class have all the good things of life. Between these two classes, a struggle must go on until all the toilers come together on the political as well as the industrial field and take and hold that which they produce by their labor. So of course that's a preamble to the IWW Constitution. So I feel very privileged that I got to grow up reading that, not quite understanding it, but identifying as a working class person because that's very unusual in the United States, people call themselves middle class. And my dad never allowed that. We were working class. So how did I um, how did I get involved with the Great Sioux Nation? Why do I think it's relevant? Uh, this book was my, my first published book in 1977. I got a PhD in history at UCLA, and I wrote The Roots of Resistance, A History of Land Tenure in New Mexico, uh, that was then published in book form in 1980 and has been reissued um, in 2007. We have it at Revolution Bookstores, if any of you are interested. Of course, there's always an Amazon, too, which is cheaper. <laughs> non labor though. <laughs> um, uh, so support independent stores, whatever their politics is my um, attitude. <laughs> but I got involved right after I uh, finished my dissertation. I, I was studying um, colonial systems, Latin American history, um, uh, empire, Spanish empire, comparing Spanish empire, British empire, and and. In doing that, coming closer and closer to what has become my life's uh, uh, scholarly work and, and much of my activist work uh, on indigenous peoples. And uh, this um, book comes out of being kind of uh, recruited, uh, kind of kicking and screaming, not wanting to do it getting involved in the aftermath of the Wounded Knee Siege of 1973. When, uh, when it was over, after two and a half months, um, the uh, th over 300 people were arrested who had been inside. And that whole siege was uh, about many things, but it was a uh, central issue was the Sioux Treaty of 1868, the Peace and Freedom Treaty that established borders, which the Sioux had never had before, 
but the borders were all of the states of South Dakota, North Dakota, Nebraska, parts of Colorado, and Wyoming, and into Minnesota. It was a large, was a large territory. And that treaty was supposed to uh, guarantee that land forever. Well, now, as you probably know, there's seven uh, separated small reservations, and all the land was, was taken illegally after the 1868 treaty. So the Sioux Treaty um, uh, hearing that was held uh, was a motion to dismiss the charges against all the people who remaining, uh, the trials were remaining, um, due to lack of jurisdiction of the federal government uh, based on the Sioux Treaty, which said that the Sioux uh, could punish as they wished whatever crimes or misdemeanors took place in their nation. And that was simply um, not adhered to, and then Public Law 280 was passed in the 1890s uh, that took effect all criminal uh, felony jurisdiction away from uh, Native peoples and um, strip them of any kind of police sovereignty. It has all kinds of implications. For instance, the uh, Violence Against Women Act had no, um, no effect on the reservations because it's just um, free territory to go rape and rampage because the, uh, the Indian police had no jurisdiction over anyone who came in and so they just get away. So it was an invitation for anyone who wanted to uh, rape and of course in a racist way uh, uh, violence against Indian women. And it was most horrible in the Sioux reservations. So last fall when they were going to renew the Violence Against Women Act, um, the native lobby put into it in cooperation with trade unions, by the way, and also the National Organization for Women, all supported this, that the sovereignty be reinstalled, re re uh, the jurisdiction over um, people who were found, you know, um, abusing women on the reservation, and Congress held it up. And a lot of people couldn't figure out, well, why are they holding up the Violence Against Women Act? It's passed over and over, been renewed for 20 years, and that was why. But they did pass it, so that was a real event, and it was a real example of what um, an alliance, you know, coalition can do, putting pressure on Congress. And doesn't happen enough. Um, so I sort of was going to make the, the theme of uh, what I had to say tonight is uh, what, what side are you on? You know, the old uh, uh, labor song. Uh, we have to think of um, when in, in uh, 1992, the 500 year uh, anniversary of Columbus, um, U.S. and all the Latin American countries and Spain and the Vatican um, were making this a celebration of the bringing of civilization to Christianity to the Americas. And we had by then quite a strong international lobby. We had already been working 20 years in the United Nations, um, getting some you know international law form. So we we. We also got Rigoberto Menchu, um, the Nobel Peace Prize, which gave a high visibility to indigenous peoples in 1992. But the Latin American countries, um, US and Canada, as a bloc, um, were supporting these celebrations of Columbus. And only Cuba uh, withdrew it. They had the most to lose because Spain was the main force behind these celebrations. And with, a, with the American um, boycott, practically blockade of Cuba, economic blockade, uh, Spanish investments are crucial to survival in Cuba. Uh, it's the main investor, and Spain pulled out all their investments and really punished Cuba for what Fidel Castro said you have to choose which side you're on. 
And I'm now having to choose, am I on the side of the colonizer or the colonized? He says, I'm going to be on the side of the colonized. And took that stand. So I think it's a real example of a sacrifice for principled stand. And um, I would like to see, I think it would actually energize the um, labor movement, the workers' movement, to be conscious uh, in North America, in Hawaii, uh, other U.S. Uh, colonized areas and holdings, uh, that there's a support both ways, asking for support from the Native Hawaiians and Native people for uh, labor issues involvement. Often they are, you know, involved without anything coming in return, reciprocal, of supporting the land issues and sovereignty issues. So that's what this book is really about. My own background and history and who I am sort of merges these two things. And I always, I always like to bring them together as I can, as much as I can. I think we're totally dependent upon mobilizing masses of workers in the world, but especially in the United States, that nothing will change. But without the consciousness of colonialism, that it's a settler state and a mindset in which um, the founding and the exceptionalism leads us to constant wars. Um, Putin was right the other day, you know, the exceptionalism. Uh, thing uh, it was good to get it out in the open because it's rarely ever even questioned you know, by ordinary U.S. citizens. So that's what I'll leave you with, and hopefully, uh, Rich, and he and I have talked about this a lot. And we'll have um, some responses to what I've had to say in front of you too. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.